can we live with brown bears on their turf? What do you do when a 1,000 pound bear is coming right at you? Is it possible for human and America's largest land carnivore to coexist? Over the next three weeks, we'll live right in the heart of the highest concentration of brown bears in the world with no way out. Our mission, to experience a brown bear's life from the inside out, to see the world of the bear like the bear. Be an insider in the creature world. That's the mission. The Krat Brothers. Dropped in remote regions to live with the creatures. Through their eyes. On their turf. By their rules. Be the creature. We're here, way up in the Northern Hemisphere, flying over Alaska. Now making our approach to the Alaska Peninsula. In these coastal marshes, there are more brown bears than anywhere else in the world. I think we're gonna be seeing them soon. We have so many brown bears to check out and try to integrate into their lives and really experience the world of the wild bear. We're gonna get on the ground in this huge concentration of bears, follow them around, on foot, 20 Once you could see bears like this in California and all over the western United States, now only in special places like Alaska. We're here for our third summer in a row. The bears are here because there's plenty of food and every bear is in a race against time to pack enough food in over a short summer to fatten up and survive a brutal six month winter sleep. Right here in this special place of abundant food, the bears have let us in. But we can never forget that bears are dangerous with an explosive power. We always have to be on our best bear behavior. <laughs> We're headed right down into the bays there. All right, and close. Yeah, have arrived. We threw ourselves back into the world of coastal brown bears with no time to waste. This is ice cold glacier water. It's a powerful current. Your hip boots. Look, the current's pretty strong, too. Woo! Every inch of my hip boots. <laughs> it almost went right in. I needed every inch. <laughs> All right. Chris, a bear. Two, they're grazing away. You know, the idea that bears graze like cows never ceases to amaze me. But it is that grass, that sedge, that's bringing them out here. Big one's heading towards the blonde. He wants to get out of there. All right, okay. I think this bear doesn't want anything to do with this male because bigger bears kill smaller bears. And he may try to use us as a shield, <laughs> keeping us between him and that male, because, oh, wow. See the big boar over there? See him, he's headed this way, too. He's still coming. This bear just wants to eat. See that half-hearted charge? He's afraid of that big guy. So what's he gonna think of us? Oh, shut out the pepper spray. That's all we've got to slow him down if he charges. He's much more worried about the big bruiser than he is about us. Yeah, you know, he may have come up to us, though, just as a little added security with that big bruiser. Because now he's moving off as the big male moves over. All right. That's what he's done. He's gotten in on the other side of us, using us as a shield. I mean, he's probably about four or five. He's coming into his own, but he's not ready to go head to head with the really mature males who are doing the breeding who are about eight and have a lot more weight on them. This guy must be a thousand pounds. He's pushing him off, claiming all the sedge. 
It's the urgency of their need to feed that can make a bear dangerous. Whoa. Um, the, the big guy has actually circled around. And is now focused on us. Do we need to back off here, Chris? For real. If we back off now, he could charge. Better stay put. Oh my gosh, do you see the scar on his back? That's gotta be painful. And pain makes a bear unpredictable. He's been fighting. He has been fighting. We can only just stay still. Because if he learns to push us like we're bears, he might decide to attack us like we're bears. Look, he's heading towards the younger guy. He's not going to let him eat here. This is bear hierarchy in action. He's focused on that young one who's a threat. And in three years, the youngster may really challenge him. But for now, he knows his place. And we had to remember ours. We were right where we wanted to be, right smack in the middle of intense bear activity. And for our own survival, we had to step back, set up a secure camp before we forayed any deeper into the world of the brown bear. This here, this is a bear-proof container. This is where we're gonna store all our food. And uh, it's pretty bear-proof. They'll try to get in, but they won't be able to. You need to keep your food safe, no matter what kind of brown bears are around. Coastals, grizzlies of the lower 48, Kodiaks, they're all brown bears. And you gotta be careful no matter where you are or what kind of brown bear you're living with. All right. We're gonna go in here, we're gonna make a lot of noise too, just in case. Through this thick stuff, you gotta keep talking. Let the bears know we're coming. So it's good that Chris and I can keep shouting at each other, right Chris? That's right. Hey bears, coming through. We're setting up the solar electric fence here and set up our tents inside it. It'll help keep the bears out so they don't destroy our gear. It is an electric fence that's powered by the sun. Plus, to keep our equipment going, we need solar chargers. We need batteries. We need the essential things so we can record the behaviors that we see and document what it's like to be these animals. But the most important thing we bring with us is bear experience. Before we could get this close, it took us many years of studying bears, learning about them and their body language. That's critical for any meaningful creature coexistence. Day two, 4 a.m. Alaska Daylight Time. <sighs> oh, it's pretty cloudy, but calm. Pretty warm. The calm before the storm? <sighs> Could be a good bear day. Oh, wow. Watch out for shocks there, Chris. <sighs> All right, let's go see what the bears are up to today. The bears were here, here in huge numbers. Plus, we'd already seen they're not entirely solitary. They're interacting in social ways. What's bringing them all together is the common need to put on hundreds of pounds of body fat before hibernation. What will help them do this is small, green, tender, and nutritious for only another three weeks. It's called goose tongue sedge, and it's edible for humans. It's actually pretty good. Kind of salty. And this stuff's high in protein, about 25% protein at this time of year. It's a really good snack. Yeah. Brown bears are carnivores, but as much as 90% of what they eat is vegetation. However, as carnivores, their plant digestion is inefficient, absorbing around 22% of available nutrition. So they have to eat a lot and constantly. This flat here has been pretty much picked over by most of the bears. You can see he's having a hard time finding some good stuff to eat. A lot of searching, no grazing. 
Now this is a time when I always get really impressed by the bears. That water is cold. Even through our waders, we feel it. And these bears move through this wet, freezing landscape. Water temp, 39 degrees Fahrenheit, 4 Celsius. He's probably feeling the cold, but he can handle it. There's no frostbite. There's no hypothermia. It's amazing, all natural. These guys can deal with these elements with fur and a fat layer that can grow up to 10 inches thick before winter. Being a bear means traveling many miles and through many obstacles to get food. And now their path is our path. But rubber hip waders just don't cut it. Boy, that's cold water. It really gets your blood going. <laughs> just got to make sure we uh, stay as dry as we possibly can, because you never know when a cold storm is going to roll in, maybe even snow. And then being this far away from camp, hypothermia can set in in no time. All right. Wow, this is the spot. There are a lot of bears here. It's busy. The, the, we got to keep an eye on this guy, too, though, because he's getting pushed away by that brown guy over there. This is good real estate. You know, if they're all coming out, oh, well, we can't go that way. Who's that? We've never seen her before. Chris, do you want to back up just a little? We couldn't let our guard down now. It's close enough, Bear. Because each bear is an individual, and the outcome of each encounter, uncertain. The bears were coming in from all directions, all jockeying for position on the best feeding spot on the sedge flat, right where we were. Maybe there's no the bears coming together there. He's heading straight for us. Yeah, they're all coming out here to feed. Hope they don't think we're competition. It's close enough, bear. Yeah, let's just keep talking so he knows we're not a bear. That's a nice big boy. Yeah, you're so cool. It's close enough, bear. Talking to a bear like this, letting him know who you are and that you're not a threat is something you have to do to keep it a peaceful encounter. What a good, strong All right, bear. bear. Wow. Now he's smelling. There's another bear over there that he's looking at and getting the scent of. Maybe figuring out who it is. They always want to know who's who and what's what out here. A bear relies on his nose above all other senses. When he can smell who it is, then he can tell if there's a threat or not. Good man. <laughs> this guy doesn't seem to mind that we're here. This really shows you another side of bears that you don't hear enough about. Peacefulness. Look at this. I'm standing here, Martin's standing here, and the bear is just eating sedge. We're coexisting peacefully. No problem, no conflict. Bear's not worried. We're a little worried, but we're not showing it. <laughs> Trying not to anyway. Chris, this frosty bear's coming over. There it is, the chase. All right, what's going on? Wow. Are they siblings? Non-competitive young males, potential mates? We don't know, but the point is they do. Martin, behind us, is that another bear? Yeah. Oh, Chris, maybe. Maybe? Maybe. There's no bears coming together there. Two more. A lot of courtship action out here. Smaller males chasing that female. This female's flirting with him. She's really trying to get his attention. Wow. She got it. That female's running full tilt. That's a 35 mile an hour sprint. She wants to see what this male's made of. They're also literally in a race against time. 
Each has to gain up to five pounds of body weight per day to survive the next winter, yet still put precious time and energy into courtship and mating. Each bear has to eat enough for the individual to survive hibernation, yet mate so the species survives into the next generation. Big Bruiser's out here too. He is about as big as they get, around 1,000 pounds. In his prime, or just passing it. Hey, and he's with a female. She can't even grab a mouthful of grass. Why is he pushing her like that? That's why, a rival male. He's trying to edge his way in. He's a new male with a bald shoulder, that's right. He and Big Bruiser both want the same female. They're equal weight, equal size. Oh boy, oh boy. They are both in an intensely aggressive posture. It's back arched a bit, head down, and moving stiffly forward with that jaw popping. And that's saying to the other bear, I am not backing down, I am tough. You're not pushing me away. Oh, look at him ripping into those sticks now. A little demonstration of strength. As a bear who wants to assert himself, he rises up, rubbing his back on branches, getting his scent on it, and ripping the branches, releasing the pent-up energy, and showing to the other bear signs that he is the tougher bear. It's all about that female. As soon as these three started moving around through this flat, everybody else is moving off. A bear like Big Bruiser could easily kill a smaller bear, and would if he got the chance. Bears kill bears, and this one knows it. Bears fight it out, and uh, it's just part of who they are. Uh-oh, they are on a collision course again. This is almost like a game of chicken. Somebody's got to go. Wow. Okay, two male bears, bald shoulder and big bruiser, had already clashed once. It wasn't over yet. We had to stay with them, no matter how tired we were, no matter how wet and cold. Did it dry out okay? Oh, so wet. We had to get back out there because all signs were pointing to a major conflict. But it was like a long, drawn out siege. Neither bear would give in, neither would attack. Big bruiser, bald shoulder, and the female push between them. While this feud simmered, other bears went on fattening up for the winter. We found a bear on the beach at low tide digging for clams. If you're a bear digging for clams, you walk along the mud flats, searching for a tiny hole in the sand that signify that a clam's below the sand. And you sniff. You sniff for the scent of a clam. Using both senses together. Once you've found it, you start digging. With that huge paw and those powerful claws, it takes a lot of searching, a lot of effort to find these little morsels of meat. Raw clams are more than 12% protein, all very digestible meat for a carnivore like a bear. When you get one, you pick it open with your sharp claws, pry it, basically, with those crayon-sized claws. It's a very delicate operation. 
She scrapes away the clam shells and slurps up the meat. But she's not kidding at all. See these scraps of meat left clinging to the shells? That's bringing in the magpies. These birds get the leftovers, and they love the bears for it. But what does she think of them? Whoa, did you just see that? She chased a magpie. I'm not sure if that was done just for fun or if magpies just some, sometimes bug the bear. We all know what it's like having something bugging you when you're trying to eat. What's she looking at? Big bruiser and bald shoulder still at it. And she's aware of everything around her, even when her head's in the sand, focused on clams. Now I really want to find one. Here, I think they're clam holes. See that? See that? That's the clam getting away. When a clam senses danger, she squirts water, his muscles contract. She digs for her life. A clam can flee through the sand at one inch per second, using her muscular foot as a digging tool. Oh, oh. Oh, I think I've got him pinned. I've got him pinned against the sand. This is so much harder for me than it is for her. It's amazing. Oh, okay. I am exhausted. My hands are tired. My fingers are tired. This small clam was incredibly hard for me as a human to catch. You gotta use more shoulder, like she does. That's why she got 27, and you won. It's, it's tough. I know. She puts so much of her shoulder into it. It's amazing. Sometimes she even gets on the ground. You can see that shoulder muscle working. Those massive shoulder muscles, they give the brown bear her characteristic hump on the back. <laughs> so just put some more shoulder into it. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> and the, the interesting thing is she's the only one out here. I mean, big bruiser, bald shoulder, and the female, they're all up in the sedge still. Yeah. Those two are relentless, and the female can't even eat. Well, both sedge and clams have a lot of protein. Sedge, about 25%. Um, protein. Cost. Chris, they're gonna go. Whoa! We've got an incredible standoff here between two massive male bears. Big Bruiser and Bald Shoulder are going in. Wow. We do not want to get closer to that. Look at them. They're exhausted, drooling. Chris, big bruiser came out on top. Amazing. He's falling behind the female closer. Bald shoulders right behind him. All he's gonna do is stand up marking Chris to the left, I think. Bald shoulders standing up. Oh my gosh. Bald shoulder has a big gash under his neck. You see it? He got the worst of it. So big bruiser, he won this battle barely. That came out of the blue. We're with the bear with the clams. Now, she's gone, and this fight happens. I know. You know, they were sizing each other up yesterday, right? And then they just, it, I guess it got too much, and they both weren't going to back down, and they pushed it, and boom, it just exploded. On the left, Big Bruiser gets the height advantage. He's on top, and they are just stalemated there. And then smash, bald shoulder takes Big Bruiser down. He's down. But Big Bruiser gets the flank, pulling, tugging, and bald shoulder can't get a hold on top. He can't get anything. Then Big Bruiser makes his, he, he makes his move with a slash. The fur flies, and that's where Bold Shoulder got the gash. Oh, and that's it. Two huge, massive bears clashing like that. They can only go for so long. They're exhausted. 
Down they come, panting, huffing. These guys are clashing titans. I never in my life thought I'd see a bear fight like that. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. <laughs> Chris. We'd seen a creature event few people ever see, but it also pointed to a huge problem. Male bears kill cubs, and with that kind of male battling action, there are no mother and cubs here. And to see that side of the bear's life, we're gonna have to go up to another bay further north. Oh, look at the little ducklings. Oh, cute. So now we had to find bear cubs but it would turn out to be one of the most challenging parts of our adventure. Day eight, and we were still looking for bear cubs. So we hitched a ride on a float plane flying north to where the sedge flats were more expansive and wide open. We hoped it would be a safer place for a mother to bring her cubs to feed. We're going about 10 miles by plane. A distance which the bears can cover in a matter of hours. Bears can go over the steepest mountains. They find passes through, uh, through these ranges, and they can move around where they want to go. And that's just another amazing ability that they have. Brown bears can have life ranges as large as 1,500 square miles and can travel 20 or more miles in only a few hours. This is going to be a great place. So here we were, dropped off again on another wild and deserted Alaskan beach. But of course, in creature terms, we weren't alone. Chris, grab the camera. A fox, red fox. There's the red phase. Plus the cross phase with black and silver. He's digging for something. Did he get something to <laughs> He's working through this grass looking for something. Oh, I don't know, Chris, are you seeing what he's looking for? Is it insects? Or? He hasn't found anything yet. But check this out. There's a lot going on under there. Seeds, nuts, insects, rodents. It's very lush under here. He's eating a lot of something, but what? There's a lot of sniffing's going on. A lot of sniffing. Are you finding anything? Yeah, okay. Nose down. Shallow digging. Find one. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I didn't mean to startle you. Do you have one there? Gobbling it up, moving on, at a nice casual pace. What did he find? What's he eating? Oh, whoa, this is what he's looking for. Oh, now that is a juicy snack for a fox. Look at that. It's so juicy, you can just tell. It's plump and probably pretty yummy. In a landscape like this, where foxes aren't hunted, I'm not a threat. See, that's the thing. Humans and animals can coexist. That's one of the things Chris and I are really into, and we hope that other people would get into it. Because if all of us are acting in ways where we can coexist with the wildlife around us, that's the only way that animals and humans are going to be surviving together over the long term. Martin, he's got somebody's right here. <laughs> It's like it's something new washed up on the beach. He's curious, wants to know about all the goings on in his turf. If you're a fox, you're always scent marking your territory. And he's scent marking around our backs with every step because he has scent glands between his toes too. And the patrol continues. He had the grubs, checked out our gear, and then he's off again. Whoosh. Whose pants did he get? Hey, the rain gear. Yours! <laughs> <laughs> that is That's cool. good. I'd rather have him take mine. We could already tell this bay was different. Red fox everywhere. 
but where were the bear cubs? We were betting the success of this expedition that they were here somewhere. First we'd eat, then pick up the search. I think it's ready. It is? Yep. Easy. We don't have time to cook out here. We're much more interested in being the bears. And finding cubs. We're just eating some dehydrated food. It's actually really good though, too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy, I'm feeling good. You gotta keep looking around just in case bears smell your food. Where's the wind gone? There is none anymore. Can you believe it's one in the morning? Yeah, even with the moon, it never really gets dark in the summer, just twilight. Oh, hey, bear. Oh, look at that bear pack on this. Well, he's in bad shape. Oh, wow, he's a skinny boy. He's got a pack on the pounds and quick to be ready for hibernation. How you doing, buddy? If he only knew he'd get all the food he needs just a short swim away on that island full of seagull eggs. That's where we'd head first thing in the morning to see if a mother and cubs had discovered it again. Got the skin. This is the back. The vertebrae and ribs. Number two rib. Now we need six and five. The skeleton. The stern hatch open. It's taking shape. It's going to the All right. Building a kayak is like building the body of a sea creature. Okay. And we are the muscle and guts, lungs and heart of this sea creature. It's amazing that a bear can swim 10 miles out into the sea. If we tried swimming in this water, with it being so cold, we might last maybe around 45 minutes before we went unconscious, 90 for death. We were coming back to the island to see if a mother and her cubs, who made it out here last year, had returned. Would they be here? Day nine, and we were heading for an island off the coast. Last year, it was a haven for a mother and her two cubs. Chris, I wonder if they'll be back this year. I hope so. They'll be much bigger now. Yeah, a year older, wow. I can't wait to see them. Woo! Yeah! Got a lot of ground to cover. Yeah, gotta get up those mountains now. I forgot how steep they were. Yeah, <laughs> but that's the way the birds like it, right? Yep. With 3,000 blockus wing gulls on this island, their eggs and chicks are a feast for any bear that makes it here. Last year was such a catastrophic year for the gulls and all the other birds on this island. It was unbelievable. Those bears decimated the rookery. The gulls could only flock above them, screaming. They were defenseless as the three moved through, gobbling up chicks and eggs. It was easy pickings for the bears. Plus, they were the only bears here, so it was safe for the cubs. That sow and cubs spent almost the whole spring and summer out here on the island. So by the time they were finished, they must have cleaned up the place, wiping out nearly an entire generation of chicks. What will tell us if they're back or not is how many eggs and chicks we can find. Just want to pick my way really carefully through here so I don't step on anything. Because it looks like there are a lot of eggs and chicks. Oh, oh, he's trying to walk up here. Let's just put him back in his nest. They can keep each other warm. If you're a bear, this is easy pickings. You can just walk along, smelling, stumble right on them. You hear the gulls, right? But do you hear that peeping? It's like a beep, beep, beep. It's a real chirp, chirp. That's the oyster catcher. 
See that black bird right there? And that bird's trying to lure us away from its chicks or eggs that are hidden in here. Okay, the oyster catcher's making a fake nest now. So the oyster catcher wants me to walk over by her. She's making a lot of noise. So now I'm supposed to think as a bear, oh, yes, I found it. And when I go up to the spot where she was sitting, there's nothing there, nothing, right? And you know, I don't know where this nest could be. With both parents luring me away, it really adds to the confusion. <laughs> I love these oyster catchers. Finally, I think I found them. Right here, you can barely see them. Three little chicks. This is a great defense for them. I spent all this time looking for them, and here they are. And they won't move. And you know, they, they run with their mom. As soon as I leave here, they'll probably pop up and start scurrying off behind their mom. There she is. She's trying to distract. She wants to draw me away. So I'll let her work. She's got her nest here. All right, she's done her job. We'll let the chicks be. The father knows the coast is clear. He's gathering up the chicks. Hey, Chris. Yeah, how'd you do? Great. I finally found the oyster catcher chicks. All right. How'd you do? Lots of gull eggs. I can't believe it. And chicks. Yeah. Thousands and thousands. So many more than last year. Yeah. There are no bears out here. When there are bears out here, you just can't miss them. Right in this spot, we had the most amazing encounter. We had just sat down right here. Yeah, and the drift with that piece that the cubs were climbing on was right there. Remember, they were surprised to see us and ran back for mom. Oh yeah. And then out of the grass, that's where they came walking down onto the beach. Hey, mama bear, nice cubs. They headed straight towards us. At first, they didn't even notice we were there. The mom was looking for seagull eggs. The cubs saw us again. Then, steadily, they came closer. And then she paused. She saw us. Yeah. And the cubs were a little nervous. And then she went up in the grass. And then she her. started sniffing. Yeah. Huffing a Huffing little bit. a little bit, not sure what to do. We couldn't get up. We couldn't move because she was only, oh, you know, 30 feet away. And if we'd gotten up, that might have startled her, so we sat tight. And it looked like she was going away. But then she turned back and started yeah. coming closer. Trying to decide whether she should go around us on the beach or around us through the grass. It can get really intense when a bear approaches this close, especially a mom with cubs. If she'd sensed a threat, if we'd startled her in any way, we could have been obliterated. We had never even dared dream of getting this close to a mom and cubs. She's in charge and letting us live. And that was one of the experiences that really got us hooked on bears. But today, they're just not here. And because of that, it's a completely different island. If the mother and cubs weren't here, where were they? If they're still alive, they'll be back on the mainland somewhere. Day 18, two weeks in and still looking for bear cubs. It would be great to find the two cubs from last year, but at this point, any cub would do. I'm glad we didn't kayak today. <laughs> I know, stormy seas out there. You can really start to feel what it might be like to be a bear. You start to understand what they face, what day-to-day -day life might be like. So much of a bear's life is spent at a slow pace. Unfortunately, the flat was dominated by male bears, all potential cub killers. There was only one way to find cubs. Wait until a mother saw an opening to come in to feed. So we waited. 12 hours in the bone-chilling wind and rain. Hey, here we go, on the ridge. Cubs, on the ridge. Of course, scoping the scene. It can be dangerous out here, especially for cubs. A hill in a flat area with a lot of bear traffic is a great nursery for a mother bear and her cubs. The mother will take her cubs up there to nurse and to sleep where she can have a good vantage point of any approaching bears who may threaten her cubs. 
there's so many male bears roaming around, the mother and their cubs can use that as a lookout to make sure there aren't any male bears right in the area so they can sneak down onto the sedge flats, have something to eat in safety. But they're a little skittish because of all the males around. Life's pretty tough for these cubs. Only about 35% survive their first year. Most die of starvation, but some are killed by those male bears. This is the place to be, this nursery ridge, because as we're watching her, there's more cubs coming out with their mom over there. Oh, those little spring cubs. Born the size of a squirrel, weighing only one pound a mere two or three months ago. That 33% fat milk of the mother is causing explosive growth in these cubs. They're already the size of a small dog and starting to nibble on sedge. And then over here, there's a mother with two yearling cubs. Those cubs are about a year old. A big piece of driftwood like this is a perfect spot for one-year-olds to play. Play is preparation for bigger tests of adulthood, challenges between rival males. And the cubs are using the very same moves and maneuvers as Big Bruiser and Bald Shoulder did in their all-out brawl. <laughs> <laughs> These two little ones practicing, standing up, knocking each other. <laughs> Could it be them? I don't know for sure, but she really does look familiar. That face, I can't forget that face of that bear that was approaching us on the beach. And she's very blonde on top and brown on your sides, and I remember that distinctly too. Now the cubs, of course, they've changed so much. Gone are the natal rings. They're big, they're plump, they're fluffy. They're looking more like miniature bears than those spring cubs that they were last year. In the field, we can't say for sure, but I'm telling you, I think it's them. Hey, mom and cubs. They're learning to look out for trouble. Murder by male bear is a leading cause of cub mortality. The good news is the area is pretty free of male bears right now. And it's the midday, the time when the male bears tend not to be out here feeding. So the mothers may use this time where they can feed with their cubs in maximum safety. Oh, wow, they are beauties, Chris. She is a confident bear to lie down and nurse like that right in front of us. Wow. After filling up on milk, they just lounge around on mom. About trouble. We have a bear coming in here to the right. He's heading straight for the cubs, too. His head's up. He's looking straight at him. This bear is making a beeline straight to the mother and cubs. The mother doesn't see him yet. Cubs do. Cubs see him. Cubs spotted him. He is heading straight for them. As soon as he came out of the woods, the mother spots him. She's up. She's up now. The mother spotted him. Now she's running. She's off. They're going full steam away. Look at that. They're going full steam. Mother and cubs, they're just taking off. She's teaching her cubs to run when a male bear approaches like that. He's still interested. He's still trailing them. And they are literally running for their lives. He's not finished yet. He's turned course and is heading right towards him. She's nervous, the cubs are nervous. And they're all heading our way. He's steadily approaching them. The mother does not like this at all. Look at the way she's rounding up her cubs. Yeah, keeping herself between them and the threat. There is a theory that males will kill the cubs in order to get the female back into season so that he can mate with her and pass on his genes. He's pushing on her trail way too much. He's just pushing there too much. She's very nervous. There she goes.
that was it. That was too much. She couldn't take any more. It's back to Nursery Hill. That's exactly where she's headed. All right, they're safe for another day. She is a good mom. And he's lost interest. When you see a mother bear taking such good care of her cubs, you start wondering, does the mother love her cubs? And when you think about it, she's doing the same things a human parent does when a human takes care of their kids. So it gets really hard the more you get to understand these bears to think that love is just exclusively human. I mean, the more I see animals, the more we really get into their lives, the more you start questioning how far we've separated ourselves from other animals and whether we're really that unique, that different, and that special. At the end of our expedition, we've gotten to know the brown bear as the heaviest hibernating, shoulder-powered digging, <laughs> plant-grazing creatures who are generally peaceful unless they're provoked, who are mainly solitary but social when coming together around a common food source, and who above all else need a remote wilderness area where they can simply be a bear. We've got to get out before low tide. And we leave knowing just a little bit more about what it's like to be a bear in a bear's world.